Welcome everybody, my name is uh, Pablo Navaretti, um, I'm the uh, co-editor of Alborada and uh, if you've come before you'll know the format for these Alborada online events. Uh, this is our latest one um, which we've organized very hastily but we thought it was important to have this discussion on the back of the historic win in Sunday's presidential election runoff where Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez as president and vice president will become will be part spearheading this new left-wing government, first left-wing government that Colombia will have ever since its formation as a, as a nation in 1810. So we're delighted to have uh, with us two fantastic speakers. I'll be joined as in other Alborada events by Rachel Boothroyd, who is a contributing editor of Alborada uh, and whom uh, we, we've worked on various film projects. We've been to Colombia, we've made films there. Um, and so we'll be co-chairing this event. Uh, we have an hour, but we are, flexible. I mean, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, so we can go a little bit over. Um, so I don't want to go on too long. Uh, just to say that the two speakers we have are, um, we're privileged to have them. They're really experts in the field, uh, Colombians and, um, well, my name is half Colombian, but uh, who have a long history of working uh, on their country and, 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 and know the, the issues of human rights, peace and conflict in Colombia intimately. We have uh, Mariela Cohen, who is uh, a senior international officer at the Trade Union Congress at TUC, which uh, groups 48 uh, British, uh, well, English, Scottish and Welsh unions, I think, representing more than five and a half million workers. She's a former director and current vice chair of Justice for Colombia, uh, a great organization, an important one. I'm sure someone will uh, share the link in the comments uh, for the work they do, um, and you should support them if you can. Now, during the Colombian peace process, Mariela led an initiative uh, which facilitated sharing experience, experiences of key figures in the Northern Irish and South African processes with the Colombian negotiations. Uh, she was an advisor in these negotiations, which resulted in the historic 2016 peace agreement uh, and was involved in these negotiations in Havana and post the agreement in Bogota, particularly the chapter uh, of the agreement dealing with international verification of the implementation. In this role, she regularly liaised with the UN Verification Mission, the EU delegation and members of the UN Security Council. So uh, in other words, she, uh, we have a real expert on the issue here with us today. So thank you, Mariela, for joining us. We also have with us um, Andre uh, Gomez Suarez, who's a senior research fellow at the Center of Religion, Reconciliation and Peace at the University of Winchester. Uh, a Colombian who is also the co-founder of Colombian peace-building organization Rodemos El Dialogo. Um, both have Twitters that I recommend you follow them on with, with, where they also tag their respective organizations. I'm sure we can uh, share those uh, Twitter handles in the comments. Um, just very quickly, the format is that uh, myself and Rachel will, will, will ask Andrea and Mariela a few questions, but we'll make sure that there's plenty of time for people to ask questions. Um, I would urge you to start uh, putting questions in the comments um, as soon as you want. Um, we will allow, we would prefer to take them from, from the chat section, but if you have a compelling urge to, to read it out, we can do that. But we would say uh, the questions should be questions and not you know, speeches to, in order to, for us to get as much, uh, to cover as much ground and to get as many different uh, points of view across. So uh, without further, just to say, um, that our website has a number of uh, articles related uh, around the election and in the aftermath we are publishing a, a number of articles this week. Um, you can support Alborada, an independent media organization, if you go to the support section so that we can do more of these events, our supporters do get uh, we have free entry to these, although you can get free tickets to these, but we want to, uh, the whole point of Alborada is to promote debate on the issues of politics, media and culture and to offer a kind of uh, I suppose a different perspective to those that you find in the mainstream media and in other sort of narratives. So welcome uh, to the uh, event and uh, I'll pass over to, to Rachel to get things uh, going. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks Pablo for the introduction and big thanks to Andre and Mariela for being here to talk to us. Um, like Pablo said, we're here to discuss the really stunning results of Sunday's uh, elections in Colombia, which saw the broadly progressive and pro-peace coalition known as the Historic Pact um, chosen to lead 
uh, the country under the presidency of leftist Gustavo Petro and his running mate uh, activist Francia Marquez and they beat the populist right-wing um, kind of Trump-esque candidate Rodolfo Hernandez um, and basically in, um, interrupting over 200 years of elite rule in Colombia so it's um, it's a really big thing, no es poca cosa. Um, like Pablo said, it's not. It's the first time that a leftist has been elected to the presidency in Colombia, um, and it's also the first time that a black politician and a black woman will hold the vice presidency. So, um, just before we go to some questions, I'm just going to give a bit of background on the two, um, on Petro and Marquez. So Petro is a kind of uh, left as veteran in Colombia, he participated in the M19, which was a guerrilla movement in the 70s. Um, he was in jail briefly for his activities and he came out uh, ready to embrace electoral politics. His party is Colombia Humana and it forms part of the historic pact. And he's also been mayor of Bogota, although that was briefly interrupted. We can talk about that a bit later. And he's also run for the presidency unsuccessfully twice before. Um, Francia Marquez, on the other hand, is, is a really well respected uh, land and environmental activist born in the Cauca, um, which is one of Colombia's principal conflict zones. And she's really close to and held in really high regard by a lot of the country's popular movements. So she's really, really important. And I think she's a really interesting figure. So we should. I uh, definitely get round to talking a little bit more about her uh, later on. So the historic pact's main pledges to the electorate are broadly around social justice, uh, land reform, combating the climate emergency, and perhaps most importantly, to bring peace to Colombia, uh, which has been ripped apart over the last 60 years um, and possibly even longer by a, a civil war, ostensibly between the US-backed states and state-linked right-wing paramilitaries and a left-wing uh, guerrilla movement, of which the biggest group um, was the FARC, which is the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, which have now since uh, disbanded. So this war has basically seen leftists, activists, trade unionists exterminated en masse. And even though the peace accords were signed in 2016, They've never been truly uh, fully implemented and quite simply the, the killing hasn't stopped. So to, to have this kind of movement that's pro-peace elected uh, is huge. Um, and so if we could go to Mariella to begin with, um, it would be really good to get your thoughts on, on the significance of this, especially as you've worked so closely um, in terms of the peace accords. Um, in Colombia, so you know, what does it mean for police uh, and for the pe the peace in the country? What does it mean for the peace accords? Um, and even across the region, I think it'll it'll have an impact. So if we could just get your thoughts. I know that's a big question, but um, I'd like to hear what you think. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, thanks to Paolo and Rachel for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, and hi to everyone, especially to all the Colombianas and Colombianos. And to Andre, it is great to share a panel with Andre. We're good friends and have worked together. So it's it's looking forward to hearing his, his thoughts as well. I think in terms of why is this significant? I was going to make a few comments about why it's significant generally and then talk a bit more about the peace process. I think, you know, if you've, as people have said, this is the first time ever that a left-wing government has been elected in Colombia. There hasn't even been a centre government in Colombia. So this is a huge, huge thing. And I think, you know, some key points, the fact that they've received more votes than any other elected president, the fact that the voter turnout was so much bigger than previous elections, it, it was 58%, the average is 48%. The fact that so many young people um, who have been associated with abstention turned out to vote, it was hugely moving. I'm sure some of you have seen the footage of indigenous communities, black communities traveling miles on canoes, walking to, to be able to exercise their right to vote. Um, I think a big shift also happened in the center. A lot of people that supported previous President Santos, um, who promoted um, 
voting in blanco, you know, spoiling their ballot at the last election to not choose between Pedro and Duque this time round did support Pedro, I think realizing the significance of what it would mean to have another government that doesn't implement the peace agreement. It's also significant because, you know, as you said, Francia Marquez is the first ever black vice president, you know, to have someone that looks like the most marginalized communities on Colombia. She's from Cauca, one of the regions where the most you know, community leaders are assassinated in her victory speech. She talked about patriarchy. She talked about structural racism. She mentioned all the leaders who've been assassinated. So she talked about things that people have been silenced for talking about in Colombia, have been assassinated for talking about in Colombia. Um, Pedro also in his speech, you know, he did make, and I think this is a sign of you know, the intelligence of, of Pedro and the way he's going to work in terms of talking about reconciliation, talking about unity, he made a strong gesture, you know, to the opposition in his speech. And the other thing, you know, that I think was significant, they had the mother of one of the student activists who was killed during the protests in recent years, killed by the police, they had the mother on the stage during their victory speeches. And um, when you think about the peace process, if you look at, you know, the peace agreement, I'm sure a lot of you know, went to a plebiscite, went to a referendum in, in 2016, and it, and it was defeated um, in that first referendum, then it, then it was approved in the Congress. But if you look at the map of the vote of the peace agreement and compare it with the map of the vote of this election, there is a strong correlation. You know, the Pacific, the Atlantic coast, the poor, hard hit regions voting for Pedro. Um, so I think this victory, you know, it has to be seen in its historical context. This comes on the back of decades of popular struggle, of organizing, of the recent years of mobilization, of strikes, of protests. But also this is a victory of the peace agreement. The peace agreement, you know, made one of its key aims was to open up democratic space, um, was to make space for people who have a different vision to be able to put that forward in the political sphere without fear of repression. Now that fear of repression hasn't gone because we've seen so many people murdered in the last years, but that space, I think where people have felt hope and the possibility of change um, and have been able to organize and, and organize this broad coalition. I think that is a victory of the peace agreement and we need to see it in that context. It's also the peace agreement has taken away that excuse used by the state and by, um, by paramilitary groups for so long that anyone who has a different vision is a guerrilla and that that argument doesn't wash anymore, you know, it, it just doesn't wash. In terms of Petro's program, um, I'm sure Andre will, you know, talk more about this, but, you know, he's called for a national agreement. He's called for support to implement the peace agreement, to implement progressive tax reform, pensions reform, um, rural reform, to, to invest in domestic production, and to move away on this reliance on the extractive industry. And that's really linked to his environmental program, which is really ambitious um, and really important for a country like Colombia and, and a region like Latin America. He's talked about investing in education and healthcare and dealing with inequality, which Colombia has the second highest inequality in, in Latin America. I think a quote that was interesting in his speech, he said, we are going to develop capitalism, not because we love it, but because first we have to overcome feudalism and new slaveries, and we have to create a democracy. So I think that's where, you know, if you're starting in Colombia, you have to see what's happened for decades under this economic model, but also that there's never been reform since, you know, there's never been um, land reform, there's never been any kind of modern reform even. Um, I think it's also significant that the US recognized his victory quickly, um, and, and that's important. It shouldn't be, but it is obviously important. But I think Pedro has huge challenges. He doesn't have a majority in the Congress. He only has four years with no second term. And there's some real challenges. Um, and I think we need to manage expectations. Obviously, we're all elated and, and happy, but we need to manage expectations and need to think through, you know, what some of those challenges are going to be. And particularly with regards to implementing the peace agreement, he has the will, and I believe they've done a lot of work. Um, in preparing what their vision of peace is going to be. There's not only implementing the peace agreement, 
uh, with the FARC, but there's also opening up talks with the ELN, the guerrilla organization that Duque abandoned the talks of. Also with other groups, you know, FARC members that left disillusioned with the process, there's going to need to be, you know, a series of peace processes really to, to deal with those. And to implement the peace agreement, he's going to have to confront the issue of paramilitaries. Um, and also the military and the police, which I think is going to be a huge challenge. The Santos government, you know, couldn't or wouldn't negotiate structural reform to the military and the police in, in Havana. Um, there's not been a reform of the military or the police. I was just in Colombia a few weeks. Well, I just got back on Friday, but I was on a Justice for Colombia delegation with union leaders and, and politicians from Ireland and Britain and Spain. And we heard a lot from human rights activists about the internal enemy doctrine, the security doctrine that the military and police still, you know, kind of have in their structures and the way they treat any opposition. So I think he's going to have a huge challenge in actually dealing with the military and, and how you how you reform a structure that has been so historically repressive and, and repressive right now. We had you know, we went to Putumayo um, near the Amazon region, near the Ecuadorian border. We heard uh, testimonies and harrowing testimonies that however many times I've heard them over the years, they still just, you know, hurt so much to hear them. We heard from relatives and from survivors of an army massacre that um, the army committed in February, where they um, killed 11 people and then said they were the dissidents. So this is, you know, that's not going to change overnight uh, with Pedro being in the in the in the presidency. Uh, the paramilitaries also have grown under Duque. You have the whole north of Colombia was recently shut down by what's called an armed strike by the Clan de Golfo paramilitary group. So there's a lot of challenges, and the peace agreement has, you know, really interesting well thought out chapter to deal with security issues to revive a national security commission that's meant to dismantle those groups and and Pedro will you know hopefully be reactivating all of those mechanisms which have been abandoned under Duque there's also the huge issue of um, rural reform investment in the countryside the whole issue in the peace agreement of dealing with coca crops we heard from many coca farmers who have no other you know alternative to live off other than growing coca and the military response that the the current administration has mm -hmm. has confronted them with and and hopefully Petro will you know implement the crop substitution program which will be so important um so i think yeah we need to be obviously full of of hope and happiness but also be realistic about the challenges he faces. The day of the election, two Bagdad historical activists were murdered. Um, we've had, you know, over 320 FARC guerrillas who, um, former guerrillas who laid down their weapons have been murdered. Over 1,300 community leaders, civil society activists, trade unionists, environmental leaders murdered since the peace agreement. Um, so I think these are all challenges that he's going to have to face. And in terms of the region, maybe there'll be more time to go into that in, in questions. But obviously, this is, you know, it's amazing to see Colombia now part of this wave of progressive governments that represent genuinely um, the people of, of those countries. And Colombia has always been the kind of stronghold of, of US policy in Latin America. So this is a huge, huge step. And I just think it's important to acknowledge all the sacrifice and all the lives um, of all our, you know, compañeros and compañeras who've been killed in this struggle. This, I think many, many people that, you know, we've worked with and, and have loved over the years would have loved to see this moment. And I think it's, you know, their victory as well. So I just wanted to pay tribute to all of those people as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mariella. It's it's really interesting to hear you, you know, you talk about your recent trip to Colombia and you know, and I think it's true what you're saying, this will mean so much to so many people. Um Andre, if we could just bring you in. How do you think Pe uh, Petra is gonna navigate all these challenges that Mariella has just talked about? Because as we know, you know, we've seen the pink tide, we've seen them try to grapple with um, the legacies of neoliberalism, authoritarianism in their respective countries, but Colombia, you know, a huge civil war like this, the amount of violence, a police 
um, force which which hasn't been reformed, like Mariella said, and the army. Um, plus, you know, the, the the extremely close relationship with the US. How do you see that? How do you see Petro government um, and Marcus's government you know, navigating all those those obstacles really to deliver what is promised? Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Pablo, and thank you, Agrada, for this invitation. It's great to be here, and it's uh, a pleasure to meet new people and to be with Mariela in this panel. Um, I think Mariela has covered a lot of ground, and, and the question that you are asking me, um, I would like to sort of frame it a bit also, to sort of talking about this historical moment and then get to that. Um, the first thing that I would like to say is that... Uh, this is absolutely significant for Colombia. Um, you know, if, 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 if you think about uh, what this means is that in the 1980s, the FARC tried to create a political party that was the Patriotic Union that created a really light of hope in that moment and inspired many people to believe that it was possible to transform the country by using democracy and by you know getting into politics and 5000 other members of the patriotic union were killed um so this is a long long waiting process and most of these members were killed because they were stigmatized as being guerrilla fighters you know like disguised guerrilla fighters so today more than 30 years later to have a president who is a former guerrilla fighter, openly a former guerrilla fighter of the M-19, is absolutely significant for Colombia. And it's a really important step for reconciliation in Colombia. Because instead of getting there and his first official speech to show that he wanted to take revenge against those who targeted the left, he actually invited for unity and for a different treatment to those who have been on the other side. He named even Álvaro Uribe, he named uh, Federico Gutiérrez, he named all of the people in the opposition and in the right wing and extreme right wing and invited them to try to work together. And I think this is absolutely important. Now, the second thing that I wanted to say is that is related also with something that Mariela mentioned. The peace referendum in Colombia was a very sad moment because it was the political defeat of peace. And it didn't matter how much you try to get over this political defeat. There was only one way to reverse that. And it was by having a political victory. And this political victory should have happened in 2018 and it didn't happen because in 2018 Duque was elected as president of Colombia and it was the second defeat of peace. So to have today the Pacto Historico and Petro elected as president of Colombia is a really important political victory of peace in Colombia and we need to understand the dimension of this. The third thing that I wanted to say is that in Petro's speech, he mentioned the word dialogue many times. And I think this is a key to understand how he is going to tackle the challenges that we, Mariela was mentioning. The only way Petro is going to survive four years and probably is going to hand over this presidency to another progressive candidate is by engaging in a broad and wide political dialogue with different sectors of Colombian society. In Colombia, there is a feeling that Maria Jimena Duzan has called petrophobia. And many of the business sector, many of the political elites, many of the popular sectors of Colombian society who have been dominated by authoritarian citizenship are in full of petrophobia. They are afraid of Petro and they are really worried about him. 
And for example, today the dollar has gone up 200 pesos and the stock market change in Colombia has had a, a very serious impact today. And people are reading this as a urgent call to take their capitals out of the country and to flee the country. The middle, you know, like these are the upper middle classes and the middle class, some of the middle classes. The only way Petro is going to dismantle that fear of that people have of him is by engaging in a broad dialogue with the business sector, with a broad dialogue with political opposition. And I think that's going to, and, and, and a dialogue with the U.S., and a dialogue with different actors, with different stakeholders. If something we have learned from this that, that Petro has done in the, the historic pact or the Pacto Historico, is that he has understood that in order to bring about, to develop capitalism first, in order to create a more humane economic model in Colombia, he needs to build bridges with those who are on the other side and that he cannot take this opportunity of getting to power as doing a revolution of changing the whole economic model from, you know, the strike of a, of a pen. And I think that is his bigger, biggest capital, is that actually he, in the Pacto Historico, as Mariela mentioned, has managed to bring sectors of Santismo or centos, se sectors of the political establishment and these sectors of the political establishment have understood that Colombia needs to go to the structural reforms and are willing to push for transformations that they were not willing before. And I think this is absolutely fundamental because what Santos did during his administration was to split the establishment into two sectors, the reactionary sectors that were unwilling to do politi structural reforms and a new sector who understands that the country needs to modernize and that the inequality that we have cannot continue. And I think Petro has understood that. And in many places I've said that if we want to understand what we have in front in Colombia at this moment, is that Petro is quite, he's starting his first presidency in this moment, his presidency in this moment, as Santos did in 2014. Santos won in 2014 thanks to the link, the, the, the support between the right, the center, and the left. And Petro has been elected thanks to that too. It's a very similar platform. You know, Petro has had the support of re retired military officers. He has had the support of the business sector in some cases. He's got the support of sectors who the left had never been able to bring on board in order to think that the country needs a structural transformations. So I think that's what it's going to do. And let me finish by saying two more things. First, I think Petro, as Mariela said, is going to own, uh, is going to use the peace process and, and the peace agreement of the FARC in order to build broad consensus in Congress. We know that the political sectors in Congress have been in some cases a majority in order to stop some of the terrible things that Duque wanted to do. For example, the, the, the special seats for victims in Congress were you know, reinstituted during the Duque administration thanks to the work of a broad political coalition. And I think Santo uh, Petro is going to use that as a really important vessel for him to do the structural transformation that he wants because with that he's got majorities. On top of that, I think he's going to use, he's going to take the opportunity of the final report of the Colombian Truth Commission that will be launched next week as a really important reference point to talk to different sectors of Colombian society who have been victims of the armed conflict. And I think that would become such an important effort in Petro's building and tackling different challenges, talking to the victims of the FARC, talking to the victims of the army, talking to the victims of multinational companies, talking to indigenous victims, women, victims of sexual violence, and this will become such an important policy for this government. And finally, I think he's also gonna show and back up the incredible role 
that the HEP is doing. We've seen that what the special jurisdiction for peace in Colombia has been doing is that we have seen the acknowledgement of responsibilities by members of the Colombian army of the false positive scandals. But we also have seen today, which I think is a historic day for Colombia, in which Rodrigo Londoño Echeverri and all the members of the Secretariat are acknowledging responsibility for kidnapping in Colombia. And this is an incredible example for reconciliation. And I know that Petro is going to back up these transitional justice mechanisms to try to show to the different sectors of Colombian society that this peace agreement is a way to start closing the armed conflict with the FARC and then he will be able to jump to negotiations with the ELN but probably I can talk a bit about that in, a, in the next question so that I don't monopolize the time. Thank you Andre uh, and Mariela for those uh, fascinating observations. Um, I think we've got questions. I can see there's a, a kind of a, a debate going on around where Pedro got all the extra votes that won him the election. He became the most voted president in the history of Colombia. Uh, so Carlos has asked, and I think I'm going to address this to, to Mariela uh, and add um, this question around um, where the extra votes that Pedro got, I think it was an extra 2.8 million nearly uh, that he received uh, in, the, in this runoff as opposed to the first round. Where did they come from? Was it through? Was it new people voting? Um, to what extent was it? You know, Andre has talked about Petro appealing to sectors of the right, people that never voted for for a, a left just before. Tell us a little bit about that. And and in relation to Francia Marquez, his vice president, uh, the first Afro-Colombian woman, who uh, there were regions from the Afro-Colombian communities and poorest that that voted in massive numbers. So tell us a little bit about how these two phenomena interrelate. And I know that you were keen to also discuss the, the regional implications of this victory, given that your work at the TUC, you also, I know, work on Brazil and we have the presidential elections in October, which uh, we're hopefully, if all goes to plan, Lula will, will return to the presidency after being, uh, you know, after the parliamentary coup and the, and, the, and the lawfare processes against him. So, yeah, a couple of easy questions there for Mariela and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Thanks, Pablo. Um, so I, yeah, I don't have the exact breakdown of, obviously, it's hard to say exactly where all those votes came from. I think there's a number of factors. I think um, abstention being overturned, you know, people that haven't voted before coming out to vote. Um, as I said, there's, you know, a lot of talk about young people, a lot of participation of young people, a lot of participation of um, communities that historically may have abstained, may have felt that their vote doesn't count. Um, I think also, as Andre spoke about and I spoke about, there was people that in the previous election would have voted um, for Fajardo or for a centre candidate, or would have spoiled their ballot in the second round, in, in, a, in the first round, sorry, that would have voted for centre candidates who then came out to vote um, for Pedro. And I think some people that probably you know, I think also it helped that uh, Hernandez, the, the candidate, had a, a whole load of scandals around him in the lead up to the second round. You know, he insulted the Virgin. He came out with, you know, terrible things. He refused to debate. He um, more and more kind of scandals surrounded him. So I think people that maybe wouldn't have voted Petro did um, because they saw, you know, the kind of instability and, and the really kind of unpredictability of voting for someone like Hernandez. He wasn't just a right wing, a straightforward right wing candidate. You know, he was very um, kind of unpredictable and, and it was all kind of chaotic and, and probably scared some people, I think. Um, I do think there's a slight, I know Andre's point in terms of, you know, the coalition that voted for Santos in the second round of his election and, and Pedro, but I think it is worth noting, Santos didn't need to reach out to the left vote. Um, in his election because the left voted for Santos against the far right because they wanted a peace process and they thought that Santos would deliver a peace process, which he did. Um, I think the difference here is that Pedro actually was very clever at reaching out to the center and to those Santos votes and he's had to and I think he's done a really good job at it and people around him it's not just an individual it's been a whole process of building that coalition so 
I think it speaks to the majority and to the vision of, of the left in, in Colombia that they were able to do that and to mobilize all these different sectors behind one project, people that have very, very different political views. And, you know, a, a, a broad coalition that Andre and I both are part of, Defendamos La Paz, which is people that were involved in the peace agreement, but now a lot of people that support the peace process is a reflection of that. You have everyone from the FARC to the Santos negotiators in that group, all defending the peace agreement. And I think Andre's right where he says, you know, the peace agreement is the way to bring in some of the structural reforms that Colombia needs. And if you look at what's not been implemented at the peace agreement, it's the chapters that most deal with the causes of the conflict, the issues around rural reform, the issues around political participation and the lack of democratic space, and also the issue around, you know, the killings of, of activists and the killings of the left. Those are the issues that have least been implemented. So I think there's an opportunity here to use the peace agreement to start bringing in some of those structural reforms and Andre's right that you would get support you know from the center people in congress around that rather than coming just with a kind of we're gonna you know restructure the economy I think that's that's the way um Pedro will do it um in terms of the um, region, I think there's a number of issues. Um, obviously, Pedro has said he will re-establish diplomatic relations with Venezuela, which is hugely important, um, given the way Duque has, has treated Venezuela. I think we have the election, obviously, in Chile recently. We have now on October 2nd, I think, is the election in, October, in Brazil, and Lula is looking very strong um, to win. And obviously having, you know, a huge economy like Brazil move more to the left will be, you know, very significant. Hopefully there'll be, you know, moves towards revisiting that, you know, regional integration um, that was seen under the pink tide. And I think Colombia, you know, with the US military bases, with the US presence that it's had in the region, you know, that it's moved to the left is of huge significance for the whole region for, um, economic, political, social implications. I just want to say one thing about Cuba as well, while I have the opportunity, because uh, Venezuela, the Colombian government has played an awful role in the last few years in um, really hurting Cuba. Cuba played a key role in the peace negotiations with the FARC. They hosted the talks. The Norwegians and the Cubans were the two countries that supported the peace um, negotiations and have been the guarantor countries of the peace agreement and, and continue to play a huge role in supporting the peace process. Uh, the Cubans then hosted the talks uh, with the ELN guerrillas um, under, you know, as, as a request of the Colombian government under Santos. When those talks broke down for various reasons, um, the the um, Colombian government, you know, called on the Cuban government to break the protocols that had been signed as part of those peace negotiations and to return the ELN commanders um, without respecting, you know, what had been agreed in the event of a breakdown of talks. And Norway and the other guarantors all supported Cuba in not breaking the protocols because that obviously sets a very dangerous precedent for any other peace process around the world. Um, and that is one of the issues that the US used to, to put Cuba back on the list of, of states that sponsor terrorism because they haven't handed over those ELN commanders. So I think, you know, hopefully revisiting the talks, and I'm sure Andre can say more about um, what prospects there are for, for re-engaging in a peace process with the ELN. But I, I think it's important to say that this shift will hopefully, you know, mean a shift in terms of Colombia's relationships with Latin America and not playing the role of the kind of US bidding, you know, doing the US's bidding in the region. So I think that's that's important. Thanks, Mariella. Um, we've got a question here from Daniel Chapman, and he's asking how key was Francia Marquez in mobilizing for the election victory? And would this have been possible without her? And I think not just about if we could talk about Francia Marquez a little bit, but also maybe about the popular movement, because I think as Andre was, was talking before, we've seen this huge transformation in Colombia over the past few years where we've gone from, you know, the, the peace deal being rejected, and then there have been two national strikes, which um, in spite of this re ongoing repression, were really, really powerful, really militant. Um, and now, you know, with it, 
Petro stood twice before unsuccessfully, and now he's been success successful. The popular movement seems to have grown, it seems to have converged. Um, and now we have Francia Marquez, who, who's vice president. So um, maybe if we could talk about her, we could talk about the popular movement and what role that popular movement will have in Petro's government, if any. Um, Andre, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a really important question that also connects a bit with the with the negotiations with the ELN. I mean, Francia Marquez it was really important, uh, but to understand Colombia, you know, Colombia uh, until now <laughs> it's been a, a very conservative country with a strong right wing mentality. Um, when Francia Marquez was elected as vice presidential candidate, many political analysts thought that Petro had shot himself in the foot because he was, they thought that it was going to be very difficult to appeal to a sector of Colombian society that is quite right-wing, machista, patriarchal, you know, and who are scared of social movements and Afro-Colombian movements. Like that's, and, and who usually go to the polls. That's the other thing. It has 20% of the population is Afro-Colombian, 3% of the population is indigenous, the rest are mestizos and a small 5% are white, let's say, you know. But the people uh, in Colombia um, sort of don't, they are colorblind in a way. They, 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 some of them uh, don't have strong alliances with their own ethnicities and they are really, some of these sectors are not part of social movements. So the social movements are um, because of the long arm conflict in some cases I would say is uh, rather small, but they have the potential to grow and to grow bigger now. Um, but I think what was incredible about electing Francia Marquez is that she became a really important political star uh, and no one expected her results in the, in the, in, in, in the March elections. So when everyone started to see her as a rising star, I think they saw an opportunity to also, you know, like Obama, to gain momentum, to put on the top of the agenda, the race issue, and to say this, she represents the, los nadies, as she said, the people who are never taken into account, the left aside. And I think that became a really powerful motto and I think Francia Marquez is such a clever person who coined really important phrases, I call them scripts or dispositivos retóricos, that really helped to create a new imaginary of what was possible. So she kept talking about vivir sabroso. I don't know how to translate that, but the whole idea is like we want to be live in a party mood, you know, and that really created something really powerful amongst sectors of Colombian society who finally felt that they had the opportunity to have in government a face that was similar than theirs. And so the social movements really, who had been already supporting Petro, felt that this was a great moment for them to also reach out to those people who were outside of the social movements. Um, and, and I think that became really important. So a good thing was that you know, she somehow managed to inspire and to show to Colombians in their faces the structural right racism that underlies Colombian society. And many people felt that this was an opportunity to make a case against that. Se you know, educated sectors, urban people, and I think that they went in the, you know, to the polls and they decided to support that strategy. And that also brought sectors like Alejandro Gaviria and other sectors from the center who felt that it was the ethical stand to take to support Petro and Francia Marquez campaign for the presidency. Now, let me just wrap up this comment on this by talking about the ELN, because Francia Marquez has been part of the Cumbre Agraria, um, and, and this movement is a movement that brings together Afro-Colombian people, indigenous people, campesinos, you know, she's been part of the mining community. She's got, she's got, or she has got organized strikes in the regions. She's defending against mining, the Cauca region, and this is really important because one of the big challenges with the ELN 
is that the EL, is that the ELN is asking for structural reforms that to some extent involve the participation of people in the territories. They want direct participation of people in the territories in the negotiations and that the decisions that the people take in those territories are implemented as part of the uh, as part of the peace agreement. Um, and what's happening here with the support of these social movements for the presidency of Petro and Francia Marquez is that now the ELN somehow has gotten what they wanted and is that the people has to decide what they want and these negotiations in a way are going to be between a broad sector of social movements who are in favor of a government to do a structural reforms and an armed group that has been saying that has been fighting for those structural reforms. So I think this is a fantastic window of opportunity. Ivan Cepeda said yesterday, the senator Ivan Cepeda in Colombia said yesterday that his whole political energy for the next four years was going to be dedicated to implement what he calls total peace. Total peace means, as Mariela was mentioning, to close the armed conflict with the ELN, to bring the dissidents of the FARC into the negotiation table and to find a mechanism for the paramilitary groups to dismantle and to reincorporate into society. And in order to advance in that, I think Petro and Francia Marquez has the best ally possible who are the social movement in the regions. And probably regional dialogues are going to take place. And these social movements in those regions are going to be absolutely fundamental. And they really respect Francia Marquez for all the work that she has done. Thanks, Andre. I think you're totally right. Um, you know, and um, Francia Marquez has been so fundamental, um, and especially in creating this vision. I think you called it about about what's possible, and that's something that we see recurring in in most kind of powerful political social movements. Um, Mariela, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Do you think that the popular movement will occupy an important place in Petro's government? Um, what, how, how do you, what do you see their relationship as with Petro's government? Will it be supportive or will they have a more active role in governance? Um, what are your thoughts? I think it has to, I think. Petro's only going to be able to govern and implement what he wants with popular mobilization. And it only helps those, those aims because actually the wave of strikes, the wave of actions is what led to this impetus on the back of the peace agreement and the peace process. So I think you're going to need a lot of popular mobilization and organizing to actually carry through these, these changes. Because as we said, there's challenges in the Congress. So you need that popular support. Um, you also, as Andre said, you know, four years is a very short amount of time. Um, you need to keep organizing and building that coalition and building um, that movement in order to elect another president um, in four years, because uh, there's no second term in Colombia, um, to be able to, to carry this on, because it, there's a lot to do in a very short amount of time with a lot of challenges. So I think it's in everyone's interests um, to implement as much as possible. I think also, you know, at a regional level, there's a lot of, um, you know, popular participation that needs to happen in the peace process envisaged a lot of popular regional focus and regional, um, you know, involvement in developing the territories most abandoned by the conflict and investment in um, regional infrastructure, regional state presence. You know, there's been areas that either had the FARC acting as a substitute for the state or just have the military, you know, so you need a lot of civic participation in all areas of, of the state um, and in, in mobilization. And I think, you know, you can't look at Colombian popular organization and communities without looking at the repression, you've lost some of the best leaders, you've had people murdered who have led huge processes. And I think I always say every time a leader is killed, it's not just that life that's taken, it's not just the father or the mother or the sister, the brother, it's the proceso behind it. It's the organization and the struggle and the whole community organizing that's happened behind each leader that's killed. So I think also stopping the killings is also a way to build the popular movement beyond just saving those lives. I just wanted to pick up um, one thing that I saw in the chat, if that's okay, just in terms of this, you know, framing of Pedro reaching out to the center as somehow naive, or is this hope over, you know, experience, I think it's necessity, I think we don't have 
you know, the center in Colombia is the right. There's no, you know, traditional left, right in Colombia. And what Andre said is spot on the peace process. What it did was split the establishment. It split the oligarchy between, you know, the far right uh, with mafia interests, with paramilitary links, with drug links, with historic, you know, atrocities um, in their, in their, you know, on their, in, as their legacy with the kind of neoliberals that are right, you know, economically right wing, but they think peace is good for business. They don't believe in killing your opponents. You know, they're Democrats, but they're right wing economically. So I think that's your starting point. And that's a very different situation to when you look at, you know, other countries in Latin America that might have a traditional left and right. And this is the first time you've had the left in power. So I think it's a necessity um, and how he's approached it so far and how many people around him are approaching it, I think is something to be celebrated, not, you know, not dismissed as, as naive necessarily. So I think everyone's very aware of the risks of lawfare, the risks, you know, that we had with the military, potentially not respecting the risks of, of software fraud in the election. That's why I said, you know, it shouldn't be, but it is significant that the US has recognized it. It shouldn't be, but it is significant that Duque has recognized it. So I think we need to be realistic about what Colombia is and what Colombia has been and manage our expectations also, because we can't be purists and disappointed in a year when not everything has happened that we want to happen. So I would just say that I hope. But can I can I say just one thing that I think is significant also in, in line of what Mariela was saying, and and I know that this is going to sound a bit, but but Uribe acknowledged acknowledged that Petro's victory was clear, and that he called all his followers to respect democracy in Colombia and to acknowledge that now pres pre Petro was president. And I thought that was really incredible and probably has to do with the way how Petro has understood that he needs to be pragmatic and out of necessity, as Mariela is saying, is building bridges. Because the worst thing that could be happening in this moment in Colombia is having Alvaro Uribe burning, you know, trying to set fire the country by saying that it was a fraud that took place in Colombia in the election of, of Gustavo Petro. So I think this is a really important moment because it shows that there is going to be a small, a, a smooth transition, much smoother than we had expected because many people were very worried about how this transition was going to happen between Duque and Petro. Thanks, Andre. I mean, I hope that your uh, hope with Alvaro Uribe is well placed. I mean, I think he's uh, such a sinister character that I would be um, still worried about what he has planned for the country uh, in the future. I think there was an interesting question, uh, just to say that we were meant to finish in three minutes, but I think we've got a number of questions. And, and so if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll carry on for an extra 10 minutes or so, uh, just to try and get as many of the, of the questions and comments that are coming in uh, addressed. Uh, there was one um, by Ian, uh, which says, uh, does Petro have any plans to close or otherwise limit the US bases as part of total peace? And perhaps you could both reflect on this and in relation to the US, what is the US? You said that they quickly recognized uh, Petro, which was significant, but what does the Biden administration really think about Petro? How will they manage him? How do they view his type of leftism uh, in comparison to say Boric or obviously uh, Maduro? I mean, what, what, what do you think the Biden's government strategy is uh, to, 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 in terms of Petro? Shall I go ahead? Um, well, um, I think um, uh, in terms of uh, the, the US administration, um, I think they don't really, they don't really know Petro that well. They are a bit, they, 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 I think they are waiting to see what is going to happen. And the reason why this is the case is because um, Roy Barreras, who has been a really important ally for Petro, has been lobbying the US for a long time in order to make sure that the US has a positive stand via -vis the Petro's presidency. And I think the conversation that he had with Blinken shows that you know they are in agreement with something that Biden has been saying for a while, that is trying to focus on the environment. So on that, they are on the same page. 
um, and, and, and or they are at least rhetorically are on the same page. And I think there could be a bilateral agenda on that. And I think Petro is going to try to tack in with sectors of the Democrats who are willing to put, you know, who are very focusing on that in order for him to do the transition to clean energy in Colombia that he wants to do. So I think that's really important. And, and I think that in terms to the first question that has to do with the military bases, I mean, Petro has clearly said, if you look at his program, one of the things that is going to happen is security sector reform. You know, Mariela mentioned it. What are we going to do with the police? What are we going to do with the SMAT? Um, so I think that you know, one of the one of the policies of Petro is precisely to rethink about the military strategy in Colombia, and that involves the, the thinking about how is the relationship between the U.S. and Colombia being. Now, I would just like to finish by saying this is not easy, but Petro is thinking about who is going to be his Minister of Defense, and this is going to be really important. Now, the gossip today in Colombia is that he's thinking that a woman needs to be the Minister of Defense, and the name that is going around is of a professor who used to be a professor at Los Andes University of Law, Catalina Botero, who has worked deeply on human rights in Colombia. If she becomes the next Minister of Defense, is a person who understands deeply the issues of human rights in Colombia, and it would be the approach that Petro is taking to try to do a structural reform within the army in order to respect human rights. And that would really help in a really important discussion that needs to take place between the Colombian administration and the Biden administration. Because as we all know, you know, the security matters in Colombia are discussed in Washington. And so she is someone who can speak perfectly to the US because she is a proper you know, sophisticated intellectual who will manage to think about how to push for a better engagement of the U.S. in Colombia uh, in terms of human rights. Mariela, I mean, can, is there anything you want to add to that to the to that question around the U.S. and Colombia and, and how you see that relationship no, I, developing? I guess I would just say, yeah, the, the focus on the military is something that I think is fundamental, the focus on the police and the military. I don't think it's going to be easy. I think with the US, obviously, you know, there's there's common ground in terms of some of the environmental issues. I think the COCA issue, you know, might be complicated. And if, if he wants to implement that peace agreement in terms of the COCA issue and the regional dynamics, you know, how he's going to approach Venezuela, how he's going to approach the rest of the region. Um, but I think... What's interesting there is these kind of Santista sector, like Andre mentioned, Roy Barreras, he was a government negotiator, you know, during the peace negotiations. Some of these are very close to the Democrats in, in the US, and that will be an important, they can play an important kind of role and bridge there. Um, but I also think, yeah, that popular mobilization is important in order to give Petro that kind of mandate. Obviously, he's got the electoral mandate, but that mandate to bring to bring about change. Well, I think that brings us to the end. Um, we've managed to cover so much ground uh, in the past hours. Um, I just want to thank Mariela again and Andre for their really, really interesting contributions. Such a hopeful moment in Colombia after so long. Um, I'm sure we'll get to discuss it again. Um, yeah, it's been great. Thank you again for your participation. Um, yeah, um, I think... We've recorded this, so if you know if you want to share it as well, this will be going up on our social media accounts. There might be people who haven't uh, had chance to see it um, because we have organised it in haste, like Pablo said. Um, but yeah, great to have some positive news coming out of Colombia at long last, and um, I'm sure we'll be doing another one of these discussions again. Thanks to everyone for joining us, uh, and hopefully we'll see you again soon for our next discussion on Latin America. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. so much for the invitation. Bye. Bye. Thank you.